I'm Amy Eastwood. I'm the Senior Program Manager uh, for the Culture Protection Fund, um, and I work at the British Council. Um, so as James said, I've been asked to come and just give you a bit of information about the Culture Protection Fund, in case anyone is interested in, in making an application. Um, so I'm going to run through that sort of information today. I'd also like to just give you a, a, a flavor of the, the type of projects that we've already funded. Um, and also uh, just look at the background to the, to the fund as well. So, the Cultural Protection Fund, as you may know, was established by the UK government last year uh, by committing £30 million pounds of funding uh, to the protection of cultural heritage at risk uh, overseas uh, due to conflict. Uh, and this was a response to the ongoing destruction of cultural heritage sites across the Middle East and North Africa, um, and in recognition of the fact that uh, the loss of a loss of cultural heritage is to the detriment of people's shared sense of history, identity, and also social cohesion. Um, the fund is, is a, actually a partnership between the Department for Culture, Media, and Sport, um, and the British Council, with the British Council providing uh, the, the, the resources for managing and delivering the fund, and obviously DCMS providing the £30 million pounds for the grants. Uh, the, the fund has 12 specific uh, target countries, we call them, which are in and around the, uh, the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, and they're listed on this slide. They're all considered to be at, uh, affected by conflict in some way, be it past conflict, current conflict, or potential future conflict, so it's a, quite a broad definition of conflict. Um, and lastly, I'd just say our funding is uh, official development assistance, which is international aid, uh, which must be used to promote the economic development or social welfare of the, of the recipient countries. So with that in mind, we ask applicants to identify a development need that the project will address, um, and also to identify local partners to ensure that the project has the maximum uh, benefit for the recipient countries. And this ties in with the British Council's overall strategy for culture and development. So um, moving on now to eligibility criteria, I'm going to talk about two things. One, uh, who can apply and what we can fund. So um, aside from the fact that sole traders aren't eligible to apply, there's really no restriction on the type of organization uh, which can apply. Um, the important thing is that at least that the lead there's a lead applicant organization and potentially up to eight partner organizations. And the important thing is that one of those organizations involved in delivering the project is based within target countries. So if the lead applicant organization is, say, based within the UK, then um, there needs to be at least one local partner operating within one of the 12 target countries. Um, but we do also grant uh, directly to organizations which are based within the target countries. Um, each project must have a, um, oh sorry, yeah, so, so all, all the applicants must also provide a, a partnership agreement as part of the application process to outline uh, the rules and responsibilities of all the project partners and make sure that everyone is, is on board. Okay, so what do we fund? Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, the main aim of the project needs to be the benefit of one or more of the target countries. Uh, this usually means that most of the activity would be taking place within the country. However, there it, it's, it's possible that some activity such as training could take place in the UK as long as the, the, uh, the aim of the activity is for the benefit of the target countries. Uh, each project has to have a clear cultural heritage focus. So our definition of cultural heritage is, is quite broad in line with the, the consultation that we undertook. Um, it encompasses not only tangible heritage, such as archaeological sites and collections and monuments and built heritage uh, museums, but also intangible heritage like museum, uh, sorry, museums, <laughs> memories, traditions, and, and skills. Um, the, it's also important to demonstrate that the cultural heritage holds value from, for some sector of the local population. And, and we require a, a statement of local need to, to evidence this. Um, the cultural heritage has to be at risk due to conflict. So it's up to the applicant to evidence how the cultural heritage is somewhere at risk. It could be due to past conflict, like I said before, uh, current or potential future conflict. 
And then finally, uh, very importantly, we have three outcomes, cultural heritage protection, uh, which is a required outcome, training and capacity building, and advocacy and education. Um, we look at the, obviously we look at the amount of, of grant that you're requesting in terms of what we expect to be achieved. It could achieve one outcome, it could achieve three outcomes. Um, so far we found that most of the projects we're funding are achieving at least two or three outcomes. Now what I'd like to do on the next slide is just to get into these outcomes in a little more detail and explain what we mean by each outcome and then I'll go on to show you some of the projects that we've funded and, and how they're meeting these outcomes. Uh, so cultural heritage protection, as I mentioned, this one is required. Um, <clears throat> sorry. In our, so I'll just say first, in our application guidance, we, we show the outcomes here, as well as these sort of sub bullet points, which we call sub outcomes, uh, which are essentially uh, just helpful ways to explain how these outcomes may be met. So for cultural heritage protection, the first point refers to uh, the physical type work. So for example, repair, restoration, consolidation work. Um, the second point uh, refers to improved management. So this could involve development of uh, management and maintenance plans, uh, plans relating to conflict preparedness. Um, and the third one is about identification and recording. Um, so this could relate to a wide range of activities um, such as uh, digital documentation and scanning, uh, cataloging, the creation of a database, um, survey, that sort of thing. Outcome two is um, training and capacity building. Um, so this one's quite simple. We, we, we would like to see uh, local staff or volunteers gaining skills relating to sort of protecting cultural heritage, um, looking after it, or skills relating to um, things like business planning, marketing, and tourism, which will help um, people to use cultural heritage to benefit the local economy. Uh, on the second point there, you can see uh, a point about diversity. And so for the ODA funding and for the British Council, it's quite important that we can see that if you're offering training opportunities as part of a project, that you're trying to offer those to as wide a range of audiences as possible. Uh, and the third outcome is advocacy and education. And the four points here relate to activities such as um, creating new interpretation or exhibitions or materials to help people understand heritage more. Uh, the, second, the second point, again, is about understanding and learning and, and, and helping people to value their heritage more. So that could be through educational programs um, and, and different types of learning activities. Uh, the next point uh, is, is referring to getting local people involved in, in volunteering to look after their own cultural heritage. And then finally, another point about diversity and offering uh, project activities to, to a diverse range of audiences. Okay, as I said, I wanted to, to, to give you a, a flavor of the type of projects we've funded so far, but just before I do that, I'd like to give you a sort of snapshot of, of what we've done. Um, so in the financial year, last financial year, 2016-17, we funded 13 projects uh, with a value of 6.3 million. Um, we also, earlier this month, just awarded six or, se six or seven more projects, so that brings us to about 20 projects so far. Um, information about those projects won't be announced until May, so I'll just be talking about some of the projects that we funded earlier. Um, some of our projects take place in only one target country, um, but there's also some multi-country projects. So in the table to the left, you can see uh, of those 13 projects, you can see all of the different target countries which are involved in benefiting from that funding. Unfortunately, uh, to date, we haven't funded any projects in Yemen or Sudan, but that will be changing soon with the announcement of the new projects. Um, we don't really have any quotas or anything for, for these target countries, um, but we would like to see a good, a good spread of funding across a re the region. 
Um, on the right, you can see a breakdown of the types of heritage we've funded so far. Again, some of our projects work across different types of heritage, but you can see that archaeology is by far the most common type of heritage we've funded um, thus far, followed by built and intangible cultural heritage. Okay, so moving on to slightly more interesting, the projects themselves. Um, I'd start, I thought I would start off with an archaeology project, as this is an archaeology conference. Um, so the, the training in endangered archaeology methodology project has been awarded to Oxford University in association with Leicester and Durham. Um, this builds on previous work in setting up the Iamina database, which contains records relating to endangered archaeological sites across the MENA region. Um, the universities will work with local antiquities departments across six of our target countries uh, to train approximately 120 archaeologists and other heritage professionals in the Iamina recording methodology and monitoring methodology which relies on satellite and other aerial imagery, which, is making, which makes it ideal for use in conflict zones and other areas where uh, ground access is limited. So the idea is that improved monitoring will help to identify threats as an, at an early stage. Um, the local partners will be encouraged to adopt this database as a key historic environment record tool if they're ever setting up a historic environment record. And all of the participants will receive laptops with this open source GIS based uh, software already installed. Um, so in addition to the training that they're delivering, they're also delivering some advocacy and education activities, including pop-up exhibitions in, in schools and things like that. Uh, our largest grant to date has gone to the Turquoise Mountain Trust uh, for a project which aims to build on previous work to uh, continue to repair, reconstruct, and revitalize the historic uh, Murad Khani district of Kabul. And the two images on this slide illustrate the effect of decades of conflict on, um, on the district. And to the left, this is a picture from 1988. And on the right, that picture is from 2005. Um, the Turquoise Mountain Trust, as you may know, has been working in recent years to restore and reconstruct buildings uh, and provide community uh, facilities in the area. And so in the top two images, you can see before and after pictures of the interior of a traditional courtyard house, which has been restored for re reuse as part of the Institute for Afghan Arts and Architecture. And the project will, we've funded will carry on with a second phase of this project uh, focused on five historic buildings, uh, such as the house pictured at bottom left, as well as restoring uh, 45 bazaar shops in um, traditional bazaars, such as the one uh, pictured at bottom right. Uh, a number of gap sites will also be infilled um, with new buildings that will be constructed using traditional building techniques and that will also be a, a training project in itself. Uh, so there will be over 900 builders and um, 50 industry professionals gaining uh, skills in traditional Afghan building techniques through that. What? Five minutes. Okay. Um, the project will also safeguard uh, and promote traditional crafts with um, 400 artisans being trained in traditional craft and design. Um, part of this will be designing courses that will use international expertise to uh, support the artisans in creating sort of marketable um, goods and in turn uh, trying to boost the local economy. And women will be uh, strongly targeted for the engagement in this, in this type of training. All right, just moving on. Um, this is one of our small grants, uh, a project led by the University of Liverpool. It's going to focus on the historic uh, shrines associated with Yazidi identity uh, in Iraq. And uh, so many of these shrines have been, as you know, willfully destroyed in recent years. And there's been this, the displacement of several thousand Yazidis. And the connection, therefore, with the use of these shrines is, is um, at risk. So. As part of this project, um, there will be 15, a group of 15 young Yazidis who will be trained in documentation techniques to record memories uh, and experiences associated with the use of the shrines, so such as festivals and pilgrimages and things like that. Um, and they'll work with the project partners to create documentaries um, around this 
um, the use of these shrines, which will be shown on uh, TV and at a public documentary film festival that's going to bring together people from the, the heritage world um, and also government officials to discuss the future of Yazidi identity. I probably don't have time to talk about this one, but just really quickly, um, if I may, I'll just, yeah, okay, it's really quick. Um, yeah, so this one is uh, awarded to the Friends of Basra Museum. It's going to work with antiquities authorities in Iraq to complete three remaining galleries um, in the recently opened Basra Museum. And that's housed in one of Saddam Hussein's uh, former palaces. And these galleries are going to provide a permanent home for objects which were displayed in the original museum before it was looted in 1991. Okay, and then just quickly in the application process, you can find lots more information on our website, and I'll give you the address for that. Um, but we offer two streams of grants, small grants up to £100,000. Um, it's a slightly more streamlined application process, with decisions being taken on a quarterly basis, and applications can be submitted at any time. Um, <clears throat> we also offer what we call large grants, where, which are over £100,000 and up to a maximum of £2 million. Uh, there are two funding rounds for the large grants per financial year. Uh, unfortunately, the current round, we've just closed the expressions of interest, um, but we've got lots of, looks like we're going to have lots of strong bids in for this round. Um, and decisions will be taken on, on these ones in October. We should have a new funding round launched in late summer, in probably mid to late summer. Um, and just very quickly, the application process itself, this is just a, um, a simple chart to illustrate. First, if you're interested, go to the website and read the application guidance, uh, please. And then if you think that you might have an eligible project, you can submit what we call an expression of interest form. And we will do our best to provide some constructive advice on your ideas and get back to you within 10 working days on that. Um, and then if we give you a, a positive response to the expression of interest form, that means you, you look like you're eligible. It doesn't mean that you'll get funding, but you can, you can uh, move forward to submit the full application online. And this is the final slide. How decisions are made. Um, so the, the applications are assessed by the Culture Protection Fund team. Uh, which is a team of uh, grant managers with uh, backgrounds in cultural heritage and funding. Um, we take advice on all of our applications from a, a, a pool of specialist assessors, which we've recruited, who have expertise relating to uh, cultural protection and also the target countries. Uh, we also um, get advice from the local British Council offices in our target countries when it comes to assessing uh, risks and local costs. Other, we take into account other in-house expertise, such as our, uh, from our security team at the British Council. Um, we take into account a, a, compre a comprehensive uh, set of assessment criteria. So we look at things like the significance of the cultural heritage, the local need that's been demonstrated, um, the, the risk, obviously, the conflict risk, and the, uh, how well the outcomes will be achieved, value for money, and also how well outcomes will be sustain, sustained in the future. And then finally, we have a, an approvals panel that takes decisions, final decisions on all of the grants. OK. so. If you want more information about this, you can email our general email address, which is just culturalprotection at britishcouncil.org. Um, and that there is the website uh, if you'd like more information on the fund. And I'll also be around afterwards if anyone wants to speak to me. Okay.